Another lecture that is uh, a little bit more philosophical in, uh, in nature, in a way, bringing up some of the subject that I uh, brought up in the previous, uh, previous one. Um, a lecture about uh, theory and uh, history. In the Austrian school, we make a, a significant difference between uh, theory, which are economic propositions that are not hypothetical and um, and the, the his, history um, which is um, uh, a discipline far less exact um, history dealing so to speak with the past explanations of past actions and um, what would be also part of history, as Austrians conceive of it, would be entrepreneurship, that is, uh, predictions of, uh, of future behavior. Um, let me start out by um, uh, saying that it is relatively easy um, to report, so to speak, the sequence of events as they unfold in history. Um, what is far more difficult to do is um, to interpret um, the sequence um, of, of events. Um, and let me illustrate that by just two simple examples what I have in mind. Um, a very simple observation would be, for instance, in the 19th century, uh, standards of living in the United States and also in Europe um, were comparatively low. Um, taxes in the 19th century in Europe and the United States were comparatively low. and uh, economic regulations, again, in the United States and in Western Europe, were low during the 19th century. Um, if you look at the 20th century, again, if we just make simple observations, then we find um, uh, living standards in the 20th century are significantly higher than in the 19th century. Taxes are also significantly higher in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And uh, regulations are also significantly higher um, than in the 20th century. So about these observations, there is little dispute. Um, the question, however, is um, are living standards in the 20th century higher than in the 19th century? Um, because of the higher taxes in the 20th century and because of the higher regulations uh, in the 20th century? Or are living standards in the 20th century higher despite the fact that regulations in taxes in the 20th century were higher uh, than they were in the 19th century? Now you immediately realize th that the data cannot tell us which one of these interpretations is correct. That is, are we richer because of higher taxes and higher regulations? Or are we richer despite, in spite of the fact that taxes are higher and regulations are higher? Th the data are, so to speak, compatible with both interpretations, even though the interpretations are completely contradictory. Um, now, intuitively, I trust you, of course, that you know this, that you say, yeah, yes, I mean, we are richer despite the fact that taxes are higher and despite the fact that uh, regulations are higher. We would be even richer than we currently are if taxes had remained as low in the 19th century uh, and the regulations had remained as low as in the 20th century. But based on what can you say this? Um, 
again, the data do not tell you this. Uh, the data can be used just to just give you the other interpretation also. Um, uh, a second example to just make the same, same type of point. We know that welfare payments and crime rates, at least in the United States, were both comparatively low in the 1950s. Very little welfare payments were paid. Crime rates were very low at that time too. We know that on the other hand, during the 1980s and 1990s, welfare payments in the United States were significantly higher and crime rates were significantly higher also. Now again, the same questions. Um, were crime rates in the, 18, uh, in the 1980s and in the 1990s higher than in the 1950s in spite of the welfare payments, increase in the welfare payments, or because of the welfare payments. Um, again, the sequence of events, that what historians can tell us, what we all can easily agree on, this thing followed that thing, does not allow us to give an answer to this question. Um, the sequence of events is again compatible with both interpretations that are clearly incompatible with each other. Um, now I come to what theory can do. So I think it is the role of economic theory to help us decide which one of these incompatible interpretations that both refer to the same set of historical data is correct and which one is incorrect. And by theory I mean um, something that does not in turn depend on historical data itself. Because if the theory that we would use in order to make a decision between these incompatible interpretations would itself have no more solid foundation than just sequence of historical events, then obviously we, we haven't solved our problem. Then we just move one step back, then we have to explain, so to speak, uh, what the correct interpretation of those experiences is that we uh, call to help us make this, inter uh, this decision. Um, now I want to show you in the first step that we do have theoretical propositions in the natural sciences also and also in the social sciences um, that are not the validity of which is not based on historical observations that we can recognize instead uh, as being necessarily true by simply reflecting about the statements themselves. And those statements, we need to make these decisions. Let me just give you first a few examples from the natural sciences to just indicate to you what I have in mind by theoretical propositions, non-hypothetical propositions, propositions for which we do not have to cite historical evidence in order to validate them or invalidate them. For instance, no material thing can be at two places at once. Um, that I would say is a non-hypothetical statement that says something about the structure of reality. No thing can be at two places at once. No two objects can occupy the same place. 
Again, I think that it says something that is true, and it is non-hypothetical. Um, a straight line is the shortest distance between two points. No two straight lines can enclose a space. Again, you just, you, you grasp it, that no straight lines can possibly encompass a space. Um, whatever object is green all over cannot be yellow all over at the same time. Uh, again, you clearly recognize that this is not a hypothetical statement. That is something that is necessarily true. Once you hear it, you see there's no way that that cannot be the case. <clears throat> Whatever object is colored is also extended. Um, again, there's no way that we can imagine that this statement could be false. Whatever object has shape also has size. If A is part of B and B is a part of C, then A is also a part of C. Um, all of these statements, as I said, are statements that say something about real things and are clearly non-hypothetical statements. Again, this, all of that, again, uh, seem to be clear examples of uh, why Mr. Popper is just patently false in everything he says. There are huge amounts of statements that say something about real phenomena but are not in the sense that he has in mind falsifiable statements. Now let me give you a few examples from the social sciences that have the same status, saying something about real things and nonetheless being clearly non-hypothetical, being necessarily true. Human action is an actor's purposeful pursuit of valued ends with scarce means. It seems to be true of every single action. I would not know how that could be falsified. A person who would try to falsify it would itself have to pursue an end and would have to use means in order to pursue this end. That is, the attempt to falsify it would actually only prove the correctness of this statement. No one can purposefully not act. Okay. Try to purposefully not act. Um, if you have a purpose, then this is an action. You have a goal. You pursue it with means and so forth. Every action is aimed at improvement over what otherwise would have occurred. That also does not seem to be uh, falsifiable. Uh, and still says something about a real phenomenon, namely human actions. A larger quantity of a good is preferred over a smaller quantity that follows simply from what a good is. If something is a good, then of course more of a good is always preferred over less of a good. Satisfaction earlier is preferred over satisfaction later. Hundred dollars at the present uh, are more valuable to me than hundred dollars ten thousand years from now. What is consumed now cannot again be consumed later on. If the price is lowered, either the same quantity is bought or more. Prices fixed below market clearing prices lead to shortages. 
Without private property and production factors, there can be no prices, and without prices, cost accounting is impossible. Interpersonal conflict is possible only if things are scarce. We cannot have conflicts over things that exist in superabundance. Only if the limit, the supply of something is limited, is, this, is it possible that people can have conflicts over these things. No thing or part of a thing can be owned exclusively by more than one person at a time. Democracy, majority rule, is incompatible with private property. No form of taxation is uniform. That is to say, whenever there is a system of taxation, there must be always exist people who receive the taxes and people who pay the taxes. Property and property titles are distinct entities and an increase in property titles without an increase, a corresponding increase in property does not raise social wealth but only leads to a redistribution of existing wealth. This talked about, uh, we talked about fractional reserve banking, additional pieces of paper uh, without an increase in genuine money can only lead to uh, a redistribution of, of income. Um, now, the standard interpretation of these statements, according to the positivists, remember, is that all of these propositions are hypotheses. Um, but the question is, are these hypotheses? And you have already, again, from my previous lecture and again from explaining these statements, seen that they have nothing in common with what we normally consider to be hypotheses. Now I want to read you some statements that are really hypotheses and you see immediately the fundamental difference between these two types of propositions. So now a few standard hypotheses. Um, children prefer McDonald's over Burger King. That could be right, could be wrong. I don't know, that needs to be tested. Um, World by, worldwide beef consumption to pork consumption is two to one. That might be right, that might be wrong. That's certainly a hypothesis. Okay, that, that requires testing. I cannot really say if that's true or not um, at the outset. Um, so I would be perfectly willing to just pay somebody to figure out whether it is true or not. No, I probably would not pay anybody to figure that out. But there might be some morons that spend money on that sort of stuff. Um, Germans prefer Spain over Greece as vacation destination. Yeah, I, on the face of that statement, I do not know whether that is right or wrong. I'm sure it is right or wrong, but it is a hypothesis. We have to just test this whether that is the case. Um, longer education leads to higher wage rates. That's of course what teachers always try to tell you. I'm not so sure that it's true, but in any case it is a hypothesis. Might be true, might be false. Who knows? Um, Catholics vote predominantly for the Democratic Party. It happens to be true in the United States, you, but who, who knows, in other countries it might not be. In any case, it, this is an open question. On the face of it, if somebody just gives you that, you, you cannot give an answer to yes or no. You have to find out. Japanese save a quarter of their disposable income. Hypothesis. Germans drink more beer than Frenchmen. I hope they do, but again, clearly a hypothesis. 
U.S. produces more computers than other countries. Maybe, maybe not. More, most inhabitants in the United States are white and of European descent. So far that seems to be still the case, but who knows how long that will last. Um, now, the characteristic of these latter group of statements that I read you is this. You can, for all of these statements, say the opposite. That is, you can deny any of these statements without in any way saying obvious nonsense. Um, that is, you could say, for instance, children prefer Burger King over McDonald's. And people could not say, that's patently nonsense. Or you could say, worldwide beef consumption to pork consumption is 10 to 1. And you could not say, that's just, how can you say something like that? That's absolutely absurd. Um, Germans prefer Spain over uh, Greece as vacation. You can say Germans prefer Greece over Spain uh, as vacation destination. I don't know if it's right or wrong. But in any case, denying, so to speak, the first statement, saying the opposite of the st first statement, is not on the face of it an idiotic statement. It might well be true. Um, consumer spending before Christmas is higher than after Christmas. Or the opposite, consumer spending after Christmas is higher than before Christmas. Might be true. As a matter of fact, I have the feeling it becomes increasingly true because people think before Christmas prices are too high, so we basically just uh, give, uh, give the kids uh, uh, an IOU, a promise, you know, we will go shopping after Christmas, then things are all cheaper, uh, and, and spending after Christmas might be higher than, um, than before. Um, so in any case, for these hypotheses, we have not the, f not the slightest difficulties always imagining we can say exactly the opposite, and the opposite has the same status as the first statement. Which one of the two statements is right or wrong requires us to go out into the field and investigate about it. Um, but you also realize that the first type of statements that I read you, again to remind you, a larger quantity of a good is preferred over a smaller quantity of the same good. Um, uh, what is consumed now cannot be consumed again later. Um, now if you would formulate the opposite there, so that would mean uh, a smaller quantity of a good is always preferred over a larger quantity of the same good. Um, or um, what is consumed now can be consumed again tomorrow and after tomorrow and after tomorrow. When I would tell you that, then you would say, hey, there is something fundamentally wrong with you guy. Um, so that indicates that we have here two entirely different classes of statements um, at, um, at hand. Um, so now I come to the role of theory in the interpretation of historical events. So if we want to correctly interpret the sequence of historical events over which we can easily find agreement, then we need precisely statements of the sort, of the, of the first sort that I read you, these non-hypothetical statements. The role of theory, of theoretical statements, is then to correct and order the historical observations that we make. Praxeology, economic theory, 
beats experience, overrides, so to speak, experience, allows us to, to interpret experience correctly and allows us to avoid incorrect interpretations of historical events. Theory informs us what cannot possibly be and at the same time uh, it informs us what is constructively possible even if we have not yet observed it. Um, theory of the type that I gave you, um, that is also true for arithmetic for instance, uh, theory or economic propositions can only be illustrated but they cannot be confirmed or refuted by examples. Um, in principle, you can do theory without doing any history. But not the other way around. You can never do history with also, without having some fundamental knowledge about economic theory, otherwise you are bound to come up with huge numbers of false interpretations. And there are numerous examples where historians um, have given us interpretations that an economist would immediately recognize as being absurd interpretations. I want to just give you a few examples of, of that. An historian, uh, Carol Quigley, um, one of the teachers of Bill Clinton, quite a good historian, uh, wrote a famous book on the evolution of civilizations. Um, reports, for instance, about the following observation. Uh, the so-called Industrial Revolution in England, that is, where we see a big upswing in economic activity accompanied by a large increase in population size that uh, begins at 1650, 70, 1700 and so forth. Uh, Carol quickly makes the observation that um, parallel to the outbreak of the Industrial Revolution we find uh, for the first time the establishment of large-scale fractional reserve banks. And now he gives an interpretation. The observation is correct. Nobody doubts, so to speak, the parallelism of these phenomena. But his interpretation is the establishment of large-scale fractional reserve banks was responsible for the outbreak of the Industrial Revolution. Now, based on theory, of course, we know that that cannot be the explanation for the great, for, for the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution broke out despite the fact that fractional reserve banking practices were introduced at the same time. Why do we know that? because we know that an increase in the amount of paper notes printed simply cannot, physically cannot, increase the overall wealth in society. It can redistribute wealth from one group that do get these credits at the expense of impoverishing some other part of the economy. That can happen. But it cannot cause a general upswing in, uh, in economic activity. The argument would be just as stupid as we would say there was a great increase in toilet paper production, far more leaves of toilet paper were created during that time, and that is the explanation uh, for the Industrial Revolution. Um, 
if I would formulate it in this way, everybody would immediately recognize, hey, hey, there is something wrong about the explanation. But because it is referred to banking, fractional reserve banking, most people not understanding that it does not mean more than printing more toilet paper, uh, toilet paper, paper leaves, uh, they believe this sort of stuff. A completely false interpretation of the historical events. Let me give you another example. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Landis, uh, a famous economic historian at Harvard, um, wrote a book about uh, uh, the wealth and poverty of nations uh, in, in recent years. So he it explains how Spain grew and, and shrank and all, all, all sorts of things. And then he has also a chapter where he explains why uh, did the Soviet Union or the entire Soviet experiment end in such a disaster as it did? He describes the disaster correctly. I mean, uh, the, the, uh, the rivers are dirty, uh, the, uh, some of the landscapes look like, look like the moon, uh, they have machines that are 100 years old, um, uh, uh, no, no savings has been going on, uh, the, the, the health of the people has deteriorated and so forth. All the descriptions are perfectly correct. Um, so now he says, well, what is the explanation for this? So the explanation that he gives is, yes, somehow the, the Russians have some psychological deficiency. Um, they, just, they, they just didn't learn the skills of a good houseman or a housewife, you know, to clean up your place and be nice and, uh, and uh, when you make dirt, you just pick it up and what normal people do. Um, no reference, however, to the fact that yeah, in the Soviet Union there exists no private property and who in the world cares about public property as much as they care about private property? Um, I throw my cigarette butts on the street. In my private yard I rarely do that. Or at least my wife will immediately kick me if I do that sort of stuff. Um, no explanation about the fact that if there is no private property in factors of production that you cannot calculate and that you have permanent misallocation. Um, no conception of the idea that if everything is collectively owned then you externalize your costs. Then indeed there is nobody who complains if the rivers are all dirty because nobody owns the rivers. There is no complaint uh, if people cut down all the wood and nobody plants new trees because after all nobody owns this sort of stuff. Not the faintest idea about what the real explanation of the problem is. Only with theory can you explain what he correctly describes as a disaster that existed in the Soviet Union. The last example is something that I have dealt with extensively in my book, Democracy, the God that Failed, where I make an attempt to rehabilitate traditional monarchies as compared with uh, democracies, not so much in order to show that that is the non plus, non plus ultra, but to show that monarchies are relatively superior over uh, democracy, traditional monarchies. Again, if you look at history, what we see there is of course uh, the time when monarchies were basically abolished or became uh, merely ceremonial institutions, that is after World War II, 
and compare that with a time when traditional monarchies were, so to speak, the dominant form of government, that is, before, before the outbreak of World War I and even more so, of course, before the outbreak of uh, the French Revolution, um, the facts are clear. Uh, the democratic world that we have now, 20th century, is of course wealthier than the monarchical world of the 19th and 18th century. Uh, the question, however, uh, is that because of democracy or is it in spite of democracy? And you know the standard line that we hear, of course, is it is because of democracy. Because democracy is, of course, the greatest of all inventions. Um, interestingly, by the way, this is a very new phenomenon that people believe in this nonsense. Uh, if you go back in all of political theory, you don't find a single major thinker who had ever thought more about democracy than democracy being some sort of moderate communism. Um, so it was always considered to be the most lousy of all political uh, organizations. It could possibly only work in very small places. Even Rousseau, the most fanatic advocate of uh, democracy, thought that could only work in small places because in small places everybody would control all the other people and, so to, and, and the instinct of people to loot the property of people who have more than themselves uh, could be curtailed by this uh, direct social control. But this curtailing, of course, never works if you have millions and millions of people making up a society. So even the most dramatic advocate of uh, democracy, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, would consider what we have now in terms of democracy as, uh, as idiotic as idiotic can be. Um, so now, only one argument to show you how wrong this interpretation is that the transition from monarchical governments to, um, to democratic governments is responsible for the increase in wealth. My thesis is if we would have retained traditional monarchies, we would be infinitely richer now than we actually are. Why is that? From an economic point of view, the transition from traditional monarchs to uh, democratic rulers is nothing else but the trans transition from somebody who regards the country as his own property to somebody who regards the country um, uh, as something of which he is the temporary caretaker. He is not the owner, he just takes care of it for a certain period of time. And now look at what the difference is between somebody who owns something and somebody who is a temporary caretaker of something. Just take the example of a house. In one case, I make you the owner of a house, so you can pass it on to the next generation, you can sell it in the market anytime you want. And in the other case, I make you a temporary caretaker of the house. You cannot determine who will be the next caretaker. And you are not entitled to, to sell the house in the market and, and retain the income that you receive from the house yourself. Now, will that make a difference in terms of how you treat the house or in the example of kings and uh, democratic politicians, how you treat the country? And the answer is, of course, that makes a difference as day and life, uh, day and night. Uh, in one case, as an owner, you are concerned on the one hand, yes, of course, I want to get uh, high rental income out of it, but my second concern is always, what will, as a result of getting rental income out of the house, occur to the value of the stock of the house because I could sell it at any time in the market. Um, you, would want, you would not want to engage in capital consumption, for instance. Um, you would not want to increase your rental income at the expense of a more than proportional drop in the value of the house. 
you also are by and large interested in passing on to the next generation something that uh, has at least retained the value, is possibly even more valuable than you, when you inherited it. This is what most parents do. Um, what do temporary caretakers do? Temporary caretakers don't own the capital stock. Their interest is, I have to draw as much of current income out of this piece of capital, regardless of what will happen to the value of the capital stock. Even if the house afterwards is a ruin, but I have drawn a tremendous outcome, income out of it, then from my point of view, this is of course a great advantage. I must loot the country as fast as possible because what I don't loot now, I will not be able to loot in the future. Um, the king does not have an attitude, I must loot the country as fast as possible because if I don't loot it as fast as possible, uh, I will not be able to do it in the future. As a matter of fact, if he doesn't loot it as much, the value of his country will be higher and his heirs will get something better. Uh, just look, for instance, at the attitude that kings had vis-a-vis -vis, uh, debt that they incurred to the attitude that democratically elected <coughs> caretakers have towards debt that they incur. Kings were by and large held responsible for the debt. Um, even their heirs were, not in all cases, but in many cases considered to be liable for the debt incurred by their, uh, by their parents. Um, they had mortgaged some of the property and uh, people were standing there to take it away from them if they wouldn't pay up the debt. Um, that did not prevent them to increase their debt. Um, especially during wartime, but during peacetime they usually drew down their debt. Um, if you look at democratic politicians, the debt, uh, total debt goes up in wartime and in peacetime. Um, they are not personally liable for it. Um, there are always some suckers in the future that are liable for it. You would be literally stupid if you don't go continuously into debt, as our politicians of course all do, because the money that you take in, you can give out, you make plenty of friends, and um, uh, in the long run we are all dead. Uh, who cares what happens in the future? Um, so democratic politicians are short-run people. They are like little children, as I explained, in my lecture about time preference. I have to have the fun right now. Um, whereas kings tend to be behaving more <laughs> like adults do. That there are sometimes exceptions I will not deny, but there are, is a fundamental structural difference. If we would have never introduced democracy, but would have stayed and kept traditional monarchies with strong powers of the monarch, our standards of living would be infinitely higher uh, than they currently are. To this result, you can also only come if you use economic theory. An historian would never come up with this idea. An historian just simply looks at tchuh, 19th century poor, 20th century rich, 20th century democracy, 19th century monarchy, accordingly monarchy, monarchy crap, democracy, great. That's it. That's how historians operate and I'm telling you for somebody interested in economic theory, uh, history is a minefield of ridiculous interpretations over and over and over. They report the facts right but the interpretations that they give is sometimes you roll in bed and can't stop laughing. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's, it's about one of the propositions that you said at the beginning. I don't know if these were supposed to be propositions that we 
all supposed to accept as a given through. You say that in a, democra in a democratic system, the right of property, as it is two concepts, cannot be together. Yes. As I, yeah. Can you? No, private property means yeah. that the private property owner determines what is or is not to be done with his private property. Uh, democracy means majority rule. So it means other people determine what you can do with your private property. Um, so in this sense, of course, we are all not really solid private property owners anymore because what we can do with our pri private property um, it d is regulated by, <laughs> by, by people who have, wh whose property this, it, it isn't. Um, just take, take examples like um, the government just passes a law that in your private bar nobody can smoke anymore. Yeah, this is of course a violation of private property rights. Um, this, is, this is a partial expropriation of the rights of private property owners by some, some weird politicians or the majority of the people who just elect these jerks. I, I definitely agree with you. But so my other problem is, what would it be the difference having a monarch, uh, having a king? Fair enough, maybe he will be very good, but what does that help me? He can go and say, hey, you cannot do that, and I have to follow him anyway. Oh, you see, I'm not, you, you misunderstand me when you think that I'm, uh, that I'm a monarchist. I do not defend, I, I'm not a monarchist, I'm just trying to point out that of two evil things, so to speak, the monarchy is a lesser evil. Uh, as compared with um, uh, with democracy, what what I actually advocate is what I call a natural order, um, where everything is uh, privately owned, uh, and, and there exists no government at all, even courts and police forces, and uh, streets and everything is uh, done by private by private enterprises. So I'm I'm comparing, so to speak, two. Um, uh, t t uh, second, second best solutions and think of these two second best, the monarchy is to be preferred. To let me give you another example, for instance, that might illustrate that. Let's assume, for instance, um, th by the way, that this, this was initially the problem that I solved in my head before I stumbled about this uh, stumbled upon this uh, monarchy theme. And so uh, people pointed out to me the, the observation that I mentioned that in the Soviet Union of all European countries for the last 20, 30 years or so, life expectancy had fallen and whereas everywhere else it was rising and that people l looked older far beyond th their age. I mean, people, 40-year-olds looked like 60-year-olds and so forth. And they had terrible health, terrible teeth and all that stuff. I mean, everybody who was driving in the East Block could observe things like this. And people had asked me, how do you explain this? And, um, and I initially explained that in a small article by pointing out, you know, you have to see the Soviet Union and these former East Block countries were also systems that you can correctly classify as slavery, but a specific form of slavery. Slavery has two characteristics. One is you cannot run away. The, the slave master, they can always capture you. And second, a slavery is characterized by the fact that they can assign you to work here or there. So in this sense, the Soviet Union fulfilled the criterion of slavery. So did East Germany. I mean, people who tried to run away, they were shot down, <coughs> were killed. Um, similar to the slavery as it existed, let's say, in the United States before uh, 1864. Um, but there was a significant difference between the two types of slavery, the slavery in the Soviet Union and the slavery as it existed in the United States. The difference was, in the United States, that slaves were privately owned. Um, in the Soviet Union, the slaves were public slaves. 
That is, Gorbachev, Lenin, Stalin, and so forth, they could not rent these people out in the market. They didn't really have to pay a price to acquire the slave and so forth. Um, they could just assign them to whatever tasks they wanted. They could make usufruct, uh, or they had usufruct in these slaves, but not ownership in them. Um, now, does that make a difference? And I think, yeah, it does make a tremendous difference. If you give out, spend money on your slave, you will not engage in capital consumption. This is, it is very unlikely that you then, for weird reasons, will kill your slave, just as you will not kill your cow or horse for whom you have spent some money. Um, you are actually interested that they have a life a long life expectancy, um, because then they work longer for you. Uh, you are interested they have offspring, because that gives you uh, small little slaves. Um, if you look on the other hand, what they did in the Soviet Union with publicly owned slaves, they are in peacetime. Millions of people were butchered, killed. No private slave owner would ever have engaged in this massive amount of capital destruction. So if the choice would be, you must be a slave, you cannot be a free man, would you rather want to be a privately owned slave a la the American system or would you want to be a publicly owned slave a la the Soviet Union? I tell you, I would choose to be a private slave. Um, because that guarantees you a far better life. Um, it might actually give you a long life expectancy, whereas in the Soviet Union you could not even be sure that you've survived the next 10 years. Um, similar is the distinction between monarchy and democracy. You compare two systems with severe flaws, but one has far less than the other. So if I would have to choose to live under a traditional monarch, or under traditional uh, democracy, I would choose a monarch any day. And if I would have to choose to be a slave, I would want to be owned by, by some American private slave owner rather than by, by Mr. Gorbachev or Stalin or some of these guys. Okay. But I think we should stop now. We are just already very much behind in time here. You guys. But so uh, you live in the United States, not Liechtenstein. Um, what? Uh, the choice between, you said, if you had to choose between monarchy and democracy, you've chosen democracy, haven't you? So to speak. Oh, you see, like, there exist no monarchies in Europe anymore. The only monarchy that still exists in Europe is Liechtenstein. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, Mo and Monaco, and they of course do quite well. Um, and uh, w with the first of Liechtenstein, I'm already negotiating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks again.